So I have the uh, great privilege of introducing Dr. Uh, Baker this morning. Dr. Baker has been practicing general and trauma surgery uh, for over 35 years, and he's been doing it locally. He's been um, at John Muir and Contra Costa County for over 30 years. He uh, has, as you can tell from the picture that we showed up earlier this morning with the advertisement, and his title has served over 30 years in uniform with the United States Navy. He, his naval service has been uh, rather diverse in terms of he has served as commander of naval medical forces in Korea. He has served as deputy surgeon of the Pacific Fleet Command. He has deployed as part of Operation Desert Storm and Desert Shield. I think uh, if you talk to him, he's going to be most proud of the fact that he wears three Merits of Legion Award, which is the sixth highest award that the military gives. But I think that he would be even more proud of the fact that he wears that alongside his United States Marine Corps Combat Action Ribbon, which is given to those of us who have served with the Marines um, in actual combat, which is a uh, Probably it's further down on the award precedence, but is probably the one that um, those of us that wear it are most proud of. So I, Dr. Baker and I have interacted several times. He has served as a senior visiting surgeon um, recently in Landstuhl and has gone over and brought his trauma and general surgery expertise to those who are currently serving and taking care of troops coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. He is going to talk today about what is a looming public health crisis, which many of us don't necessarily talk about, but many of us have heard about. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to, to Admiral Baker. Well, I wanna thank Dr. Galanti for that nice introduction and for the invitation to come here. It's really an honor to speak to all of you. Um, I was in Davis, when the school started, I came and interviewed for medical school when it was in a couple of trailers down, down the road in Davis, and I'm very impressed at what's taken place in the intervening years, and I, I want to congratulate you all on being in a really fabulous institution. Um, as he mentioned, I had sort of a unique career. I kind of backed into the Navy at the end of my surgery residency. When I started my fellowship, I decided that I wanted to serve my country. I had traveled a little bit overseas. I felt very grateful to have grown up here and I wanted to put a couple of years in uniform. So as I started that two years in uniform, uh, it sort of went sideways in, in a lot of different ways. And uh, I'll try and explain to you how my career as a surgeon inter uh, intersected with my career as a naval officer as I came and went over the years from my private practice doing general surgery and trauma in Walnut Creek off to doing some of these other things that Dr. Galanti mentioned in my past. Uh, I was very lucky in that most of my career I was actually doing operational medicine. So the first 20 years of my career it was being deployed with operational forces, not so much doing surgery but learning how to do everything else they did from preparing for deployment to doing medical intelligence to plan for combat operations to planning humanitarian operations if North Korea collapses and there's a huge refugee crisis. So there's a lot of different facets to my career and it was only a few times that I actually did surgery, one of which was during Desert Storm, which is a whole other kind of cool story how I got away from the headquarters unit and into the Marine Corps. Um, I'll be happy to talk to you about anything you want to talk to today. I'll hang out as long as anybody wants to talk. My disclaimers are that there are some graphic slides. It's a surgery audience. That should be okay. Everything I talk about is open source. You can look it up and check it. Um, my statements are my own, so it doesn't reflect the opinions of the Department of Defense or the Department of the Navy or the Marine Corps. And uh, I don't have anything monetary to declare, except I think you covered my stay at the Marriott Courtyard last night <laughs> and uh, the great dinner with Dr. Leshikar and some of the other residents. Uh, and I'm, not try I'm gonna try to stay away from politics as best I can. We can talk that kind of stuff later on today too. Uh, it's difficult. If you're gonna be a good surgeon, you better have a nice grounding in other things as well as the humanities and literature and music. It'll, it'll make you a much better surgeon. So some of you may know this quote from Shakespeare. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. Uh, that term has been made into a book, into a movie, um, but how does the rest of it go? Anybody can finish it for me? 
So I'm doing a reverse. So, For he today that sheds his blood with me shall be my brother. This is a thought I want you to hold to the end of the lecture. Because when people put on the uniform of their country, they undergo a transformation. For many of them, it becomes the first family they've ever really had where they stick together. Uh, but also they become something, uh, part of a mission, part of a, a system of values that is something greater than just their own personal needs. And they learn values of, of responsibility and mission achievement and teamwork and looking out for each other that I'll bring you back to the end of the lecture that we'll talk a little bit about of some of my ideas of how we can do a better job caring for these veterans. Uh, as I said, the talk is split into three areas. Up until 2005, when I retired, I could really only talk about the good stuff. So we're gonna start with the good stuff. Uh, the good stuff is wars always advance medical care. And you can do this through history, whether it was you know, in Vietnam where people recognized that we needed to uh, take care of the shock lung syndrome. In Korea, where they actually deployed the first dialysis machine to the battlefield uh, in the 50s. Uh, those kinds of things always advance medical care. And as we're finding out today, and as some of your colleagues who wear the uniform in this audience can maybe give me some good examples if we get a chance to talk more, these lessons get adapted into our civilian practice. And I will show you some of those to the extent that I think we've had those into our thing. So my list of good things, is fairly simple. I'm going to start with protective gear and talk about forward surgery compared to what we used to do in my era. Uh, rapid evacuation, surgical improvements, and a little bit about telemedicine, the visiting surgeons. Um, this is the warrior of the 2010 era. In this decade, he has a Kevlar helmet. He's got a flak jacket that has ceramic plates inside of it that were developed by an orthopedic surgeon working at the Navy Hospital in Norfolk. Uh, he has ballistic eye protection. Turned out to be very important because early in the conflict, there were a lot of eye injuries from flying dust and flying things getting in people's eyes as well as from the actual uh, fragments. There are tourniquets and new battle dressings. There was a period of time, I think it was about 1993, when Advanced Trauma Life Support and the American College of Surgeons said, don't use tourniquets uh, because you'll lose a leg. Well, yeah, but if they bleed out, it's a real problem. So, you know, there was a big uproar and a lot of us, you know, back in the days before social media, you know, were typing out letters with carbon paper and sending them going, you're crazy, we need to use tourniquets, you gotta stop the bleeding. Um, I wanna take you to an example, this will be to show you a little bit about the new flak jacket that I mentioned with ceramic plates. So this is a real video taken by real bad guys. They use these videos to train people. This is in Baghdad. This is an American soldier. You see him here, he's gonna turn towards the screen. And when he turns towards the screen, he's fatally killed high-powered rifle, except he isn't. He, he gets up, he returns fire, and ultimately goes on to capture the guys and their camera. Um, I mean, he survived a fatal wound. If you look at this guy with his injuries here in the chest, those two bruises represent two high-powered rounds that hit him in the chest. Yes, he's having surgery for his other injuries, but he survived basically fatal shots because of this equipment. The equipment's fabulous. It's way better than it used to be. The early flak jackets that were first fielded around in the Korean War would stop fragments, they'd stop low velocity bullets. They wouldn't stop this. But if you have your sappy plates um, in your flak jacket, it'll stop big stuff and save your life. As, as will the Kevlar helmet. Um, why he's not smiling, I'm not sure, but he took a round right in the forehead, probably has a little bit of a headache. Uh, where does this stuff get translated into the civilian sector? Well, here's an example from the Orlando, Florida Pulse nightclub shooting, where one of the guys assaulting the shooter took a round in the head in his Kevlar helmet and survived uh, to do it. So many of these advances, uh, even in the pers personal protective gear, make it into our sector. Uh, other personal protective gear is uh, Nomex, which is applied to gloves and flight suits to keep people protected from fire. So coming up on one graphic slide for those of you who don't want to look, uh, if you are in a vehicle and it is hit and it catches fire, if you have your gloves on uh, with Nomex, your outcome is much better than if you have your gloves off. So these are each a different patient, one of whom had his gloves on, who's got his arm grafted, successfully has a functional hand. The other guy without the glove has lost all his fingers, which is a bad outcome. The problem with protective gear is two. First of all, it's heavy. 
When you put those sappy plates in your flak jacket and you wear it all day, it's uncomfortable. And then you add to that the other 30 or 40 pounds of stuff in your helmet and your weapon and you carry it around and it's 120 degrees, it gets very difficult to want to keep your protective gear on all the time. But we use these tools, these slides, to teach people why you need to keep your protective gear on. Other things that came out of this conflict that are fairly useful, a lot of hemostatic stuff. You know, you're all probably using this now uh, in the operating room from time to time. Everything from HemeCon to Quick Clot. Um, if you go back historically to Nicholas Sen, who founded the Association of Military Surgeons of the United States, was a uh, very famous guy around the, uh, also participated in the Spanish War into Cuba. Uh, he said, you know, the fate of the wounded lies in the hands of the one who applies the first dressing. That has not changed in over a hundred years. It is still extremely important what we do at that first wounding point of contact. Uh, and so the equipment's improved. This is the current favorite, I'm told, about for guys deploying, uh, using the quick clot combat gauze, which is kaolin impregnated to promote uh, the thrombosis so that you can take care of the wounds that are not amenable to tourniquets and you know maybe are broad based. So I'm going to show you a couple of those as we go. Uh, going back to 1991 when I saw my first combat casualties for Desert Storm, um, we didn't have tourniquets that were ready made so the guys were improvising them on the battlefield from pack straps. So you can see this one is strapped and there's very little blood loss on the drapes as we're getting ready to do surgery. And that's a, a critically important thing. Um, blood is life. You guys in surgery know this better than anybody else, that we can't let people have uncontrolled bleeding because every drop's gonna make a difference. The tourniquets that are now in use have been developed to be able to be put on with one hand. So there are reports of guys putting on their own, uh, being able to secure the straps, turn the windlass on it to, to control the bleeding. They're extremely effective and, and they have saved many, many, many lives. It's a big upgrade. So everybody now pretty much goes to war with a first aid kit that has a combat gauze dressing and a tourniquet in it. And there was a lot of effort put into this circa 2003 to get these things fielded um, and out to everybody before they went overseas. So let's talk a little bit about how things work in the military. You know, here you're in a 911 place where somebody's injured. You know, we're talking about do they get there in five minutes or seven minutes to the emergency room. Well, when we're on the battlefield, that five minutes or seven minutes might be an hour, two hours, three hours, depending on the tactical situation and the time and distance and the weather. Uh, helicopters can't fly when it's foggy. So you get cared for either by yourself or a buddy. That's the first point of wounding. That's the guy that needs to put on the pressure dressing or the tourniquet. Then you go to a battalion aid station and then you undergo what's called casualty evacuation. They put you in a vehicle, they put you in a helicopter, they send you somewhere to a mobile surgical facility usually. Uh, sometimes you bypass that depending on what the, the injury is and, and where people are located. And, and ultimately you go on to onward evacuation. I'm gonna talk a little bit about those two phases because that movement of patients both opened up really big problems that were evident early on. Casualty evacuation from the battlefield to a, some kind of a facility that can do definitive care, and then evacuation of the most seriously wounded to higher levels of care is what we're going to talk about. So this is tradi traditional casualty evacuation. You're on a stretcher, put you in an ambulance, put you in a helicopter, take you to where you go. So in this area, actually in Sacramento, there is a reserve uh, soldier, Staff Sergeant Emmett Spretkus, who was deployed, volunteered early in the conflict, was a paramedic here, noticed that there was a disparity in outcomes between the paramedic manned helicopters and the EMT manned helicopters. Uh, I have to say that any kind of manning was a big step up from what I had served with because we only had flights of opportunity and they weren't manned with medical personnel. You were loaded on the helicopter, you were another piece of, of being, something being transported, there really was an opportunity to care for you in the air. But we do that now. He was able to get the data, present the data, take it up the chain of command and get stimulus for paramedic level training for care en route. So care en route has become a big step. You can't just load them in the helicopter and hope everything turns out okay when you get there. So a big step. Forward surgery, this is the mobile unit of the type that I was assigned to during Desert Storm. It's mobile in name only. It takes 100 flatbed trucks. It takes 100 guys to set it up. It takes somewhere between five and seven days to get it ready. And Lord help you if you have to take it down and move it to another location. I have no idea how long that would take. But it is not mobile and it is not light and it is not flexible, it is not nimble. Uh, it is not responsive to the needs of the modern battlefield. 
but that's what we had in 1990-91. Uh, a lot of us were at that time, after subsequent to that, trying to push to get something smaller, faster, lighter, flexible, nimble. This is what it looks like in this decade. It is two tents that can be loaded onto two Humvees with trailers and taken anywhere on the battlefield. The people who train with it and set it up, and of course, as we do in our military, each branch has its own separate different one with a different name, uh, sometimes using different equipment, which is not good, um, but it's really good for the contractors and the guys who make the money on this. Um, so it can be deployed, you, you learn how to set it up. The benchmark is to be able to set it up in an hour, to be able to take it down and move it in an hour, which is truly amazing. Um, the equipment in, in this, it's everything you have to an extent in an operating room. You have your oxygen generators, you have blood supply, you have operating tables, you have lights, you have cautery, you have ultrasound, you have digital x-ray, and you can pick it up and move it wherever the battlefield takes you. The, the tents is, have little liners on the inside, as you can see, that help you with the temperature control because it can be brutal depending on the environment you're in. Um, staffed usually with about 18 to 20 people, two general surgeons and an orthopedist. Anesthesia can be provided by anesthesiologists, by nurse anesthetists, and the military dental officers are often given OJT and training to do some anesthesia. Nurses, techs, corpsmen, and the most important part, which is a big culture shift, is these guys have to be military savvy. And the reason is you're now in a dangerous place where you're on the edge of the battlefield or perhaps even in it, and you need to be able to defend yourself and your patients at a much higher level than in previous conflicts where we're behind the lines. Uh, another interesting read, when you move the forward resuscitative surgical system right to the edge of Fallujah and you're taking sniper fire, um, this Richard Jadick was a former Marine infantryman who went to medical school, became a urology resident, and then when the conflict uh, started in 2003 was at the Battle of Fallujah and he talks about putting down the scalpel, picking up his rifle, returning fire, uh, suppressing the enemy and then going back to doing what they were doing right on the edge of the battlefield. It's an interesting read um, from a guy who did it for real. So what did we accomplish by doing this? If you can move definitive care forward, so you know you're always in this dilemma in the military, do you want to move the patient back to the definitive care, do you want to move the definitive care forward? And there's goods and bads to both. If you move your definitive care forward, you know, there's some risk to it. You're putting your people at risk, you're, uh, you, you have other things. But what you want to do, and what everybody's learned, and what we've translated somewhat into civilian practice, <coughs> is to stop the bleeding. Again, number one, I'll come back to this numerous times, um, wash out the contaminated tissue. You want to make your operative times faster so you leave wounds to open. You just do enough to stabilize the patient. You put in shunts and fixators, so all you guys probably know this, but a lot of people I talk about, they don't recognize what these are, so I'll show you as we go. So damage control surgery has really come of age. We do it in our practice. We do it in our trauma centers and civilian sector. Uh, it's done a lot in the battlefield. I think you need to think about when to do it, when not to do it. Not every abdomen needs to be left open with the trauma case, obviously. You want to make things the steps that you can. But, you know, by leaving the bowel in discontinuity and just resecting the damaged segments and then dealing with it later in a more controlled situation when you resuscitated the patient, often is going to help to avoid the prolonged operating times that really led to the lethal triad of hypothermia, acidosis, and coagulopathy. And you know, you've seen it in your patients, and you just know that once you start swirling in that direction, it's really hard to undo it. So you know, we make the operations shorter, just do what you need to do, pack the abdomen, um, get them on their way. Uh, shunts for some of the major vascular injuries where you know, it might have been that I'd have to spend time harvesting a vein and then a lot of time sewing it in, you can take that major vascular injury and you can put the plastic shunt in and reestablish circulation. There are stories of these being in actually for several days in patients until they could get an opportunity to get this uh, fixed. So really important step going forward. So external fixators, wound vacs, fasciotomies. Uh, some of these guys go back to the operating room 20, 30, 40 times to get further debridement. Uh, there's so much contamination in these wounds as I'll show you and so many problems. The wound vac was a great invention. I knew I should have bought KCI stock once I saw it applied. Uh, probably too late now because there's competitors. But when you put that wound vac on, you do a couple things. You don't have to have those every eight hour dressing changes. They're not sloppy. You can actually record the amount of drainage. And what's really cool is when you get a big wound like this, where you've got this guy with this open thigh and buttock, 
that you've just debrided. And you can see the skin is gaping apart. You know that's a big time skin graft next week when you want to close that wound. However, if you put that wound vac on, one of the things it does is it co-ops the skin edges together. And you can actually close big parts of this wound primarily probably in a couple of days, like you can see here. Uh, this stuff's pretty close. And then down here, you have to be at the other end real careful not to mess up the tattoo uh, because patient satisfaction survey will come back to you eventually, right? <laughs> so, all right, so fasciotomy is crucial. We all know about compartment syndrome. This is an educational thing for a lot of our colleagues that aren't in surgery. They just got to be able to recognize that when you have a crush injury, when you have a two bone fracture, that you can get a compartment syndrome, that you, know, you can't afford to have that nerve injury. You got to release the compartment. Um, and you all know about this. The other thing that's a big change is allowing people to be a little hypotensive. You know, the early, early versions of advanced trauma life support was everybody got two IVs and two liters of saline. And, and kind of we look back at that and laugh a little bit because that's not what we do now. We do allow a little bit of hypotension. It's okay if they're perfusing their brain to be 90 or 100 systolic. Uh, we don't need to give them a lot of crystalloid. And the other thing is we give a lot of clotting factors sooner, which is huge. Uh, and the massive transfusion protocol, when we started discussing it at our trauma center, it was amazing discussion because you would have thought the blood actually came out of the pathologist's own vascular system, the way that they couldn't get past that concept of no paperwork. They were going to release the blood with no paperwork. That was really tough. Uh, but when you need the blood, you need the blood. And you need the blood uh, in the military. You know, not only we're we using more blood, but we're using a lot of fresh blood. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do that in the civilian sector, but fresh blood obviously is better than cold, frozen, whatever we have in the, in the refrigerator. Uh, you know that blood banked stuff loses its oxygen carrying capacity and there's a lot of other changes. Uh, not only that, when they get a unit of blood that you donate to the Red Cross, it's like going to a chop shop. You know, they take it and they strip out the platelets and they strip out the plasma and then they give you the red cells. And so then you got to buy it all back at about triple the cost. So it, it's, it's not the best system. We probably need to advance it now that our technology is improving. Um, the massive transfusion protocol, you all pretty much know this, but you know, you give the blood, keep it coming. You give the clotting factors, you try and uh, approach a one-to-one -one for fresh frozen plasma and red cells and keep it coming until we stop. Um, at our place, we kind of start with a menu of six units of red cells and six fresh frozens and a platelet pack. And then if we want to start adding in cryo and transanemic acid and some of these other things, a uh, whole nother discussion. The next step in evacuation when you stabilize these guys is onward evacuation. Here you are somewhere uh, out very remote perhaps, or maybe you've come into a, a higher level hospital, but how are you gonna move this guy somewhere? Um, the other thing that was the big development, so during all the conflicts up until 2003, the most seriously wounded patients could not be evacuated to the United States or to anywhere tertiary care because they were too unstable. Well, we've pretty much bridged that gap with the C-17s that are modified to move intensive care patients right up to being able to move guys on ECMO, which I, I just kind of staggers me. We're talking about some pretty big jumps. Um, you know, it's 2,100 miles from Baghdad to Landstuhl. We'll talk a little bit about Landstuhl as the receiving point, and it's 3,200 miles from Kabul to, to Landstuhl. These are big, long trips with a lot of logistic planning, uh, all the medications, all the personnel, and the thing that makes it safe is the critical care air transport team. So a CCAT team is a board certified critical care physician, a critical care nurse, respiratory therapist, usually taking care of a max of two patients. Uh, and it's their job en route to do whatever they have to do with all the equipment that they have, uh, a lot of which is in your ICU, some of which has been miniaturized. And they have all the drains and, and chest tubes and catheters. So this is a real patient on a medevac like that. Uh, he's got an intracranial pressure monitor. He's got chest tubes. He's got a Foley catheter. He's got multiple drips. Um, Looks a little bit like the wiring in my computer in my office, so you, you know it's pretty complicated. He's also wrapped up in what is uh, sort of a hypothermia preventive uh, bag to keep him from you know losing uh, heat while he's being moved, and he's got his intensive care. So when he gets moved, he's moved from the facility that he's at on a bus where the seats have been stripped out with the CCAT team taking care of him. Uh, immense attention to little details like the booties for preventing pressure ulcers during the eight-hour flight. Um, 
ultimately it's a 12 hour plus door to door event to get the guy to Landstuhl, which is a regional medical center. And it's pretty much the stop for all our casualties who are in Asia and Africa. So if you're injured in anywhere from Afghanistan to Iraq to Djibouti or Somalia, you wind up usually in, there in uh, Landstuhl, Germany. C-17 takes you to Ramstein Air Force Base. You can see it takes about 10 people to put this guy in the airplane. When you're in the airplane and it's loaded and you're looking from the back to the front, you can see on the left side of the slide, you've got some casualties that are non-intensive care. They're on litters and on the right side, you can see this row of intensive care guys. So there's a lot of clutter in the slide, but I, I see at least three intensive care guys on, on this particular photo. So with a corridor down the middle to get things done. They go to Landstuhl, which is the largest military hospital outside the US. Some of your colleagues here have had a couple of tours there. Um, it serves a lot of local US personnel. And this is what it looks like. This is a little different than your hospital. Um, anybody have any idea why it's separated out in all these different wings? Yeah, it's, it's protection against damage from, from an air raid, from a truck bomb, from a whatever, from artillery. It's what I call the World War II design because, you know, you can knock out part of it in the old days, but you couldn't knock out the whole thing. Uh, the only difficult part for me, having had a couple of total knees, is surgery clinics way over here and the ICU and the operating room are way over here, but you do get a lot of exercise walking back and forth a couple of times a day. Uh, interesting place. So when your first patient arrives in the ICU, uh, the first thing they do, everybody's gowned and gloved. There's a, a very intense handoff from the flight team. Uh, all the lines are changed and cultured. Uh, the patient's cultured every orifice. All the equipment is swabbed down and everything is really intensively clean to try and keep bacteria from getting from the battlefield into the ICU. Early on in the conflict, you know, there's some acinetobacter and some other problems. Everybody's really pretty conscious about swabbing everything down and cleaning everything up and making sure we don't transfer it from point A into the, the new hospital. Uh, it's, as you can see, an intensive handoff. Of the other good things that I can say that occurred in this conflict is telemedicine and the American Association for the Surgery of Trauma, American College of Surgeons put together a program of mentoring surgeons to go to Landstuhl and to other points, uh, sometimes in country, to work with uh, younger surgeons. Uh, and I have to say, being part of that, I learned way more than I taught, but it was a great experience on, on both sides to go for a couple weeks each year to do that. Uh, a lot of the names of surgery that you may recognize, like Peggy Knudsen from San Francisco General, uh, who's very involved now in the ACS. Uh, Don Trunke, one of my uh, mentors years ago, and somewhere down the list, they included me to be able to go be a surgery mentor. And fabulous experience, but I have to say, very stressful. And it was these repeated experiences after my retirement from 2005 till today that I'm gonna bring you some of the other things about this talk that I think are real important lessons for you. The video teleconference, I mentioned that we had a feedback loop every week, Thursday at two o'clock, you could go into the conference room and you could talk forward to the guys on the battlefield and in the major facilities. Sometimes you could even talk on the advanced facilities at BTC. And you could talk all the way back to Walter Reed Army at Bethesda Naval. You could talk to Brook Army Hospital in San Antonio, the burn unit. And you could talk to allied forces if they decided to be in the loop to see what would happen to our colleagues in Canada or, or England. Uh, it was a fabulous tool because you could tell them what had happened to the guys that they sent you on Monday and Tuesday and give them some feedback. Uh, they could tell you that don't let your eye doctor go on leave tomorrow because on this airplane there's going to be an eye injury or whatever and he's going to need them. Uh, and the third thing was the guys further down the food chain could also give you a morale booster and say, you know, that Private Smith that you sent six weeks ago, we wanted to let you know he's out of the ICU, he's in rehab, he's, he's doing really well. And so it was a, a good feedback loop, which is in great contradistinction to me getting a letter six months after I got home from Desert Storm, uh, commenting on my care on one of the wounded, 100 wounded patients that I'd taken care of. And I, they recommended I should have done this. <laughs> well, you know. Real timely, Time, timely is important, right? So another good quote for you from Hippocrates, one of the fathers of medicine, if one wants to learn surgery, one must go to war. Uh, I don't recommend it for everybody, but I can tell you it, it experientially something you will never forget, you will never regret, uh, but it really sticks with you. 
What's bad about this? This is why I call this the bad of the lecture, is this is devastating complex injuries. This is not what we see in civilian trauma very often. It's usually multiple anatomic sites with a lot of tissue destruction, gross contamination, and then we have sometimes that time lag between injury and actual treatment. So I'm going to show you a couple of those kinds of injuries. The most common signature wound of this conflict has been the impl improvised explosive device, the IED, which injures you in many ways. It's everything from penetrating fragments to a blast overpressure that ruptures eardrums and alveoli to actually flinging you perhaps into the side of your Bradley fighting vehicle or into a wall. Um, so there's you know primary tertiary kinds of injuries. It's a, it's a whole spectrum of things, including burn and blast and inhalation. So that's what we're going to talk about. So this is one of the kinds of blast injuries that's seen. Uh, this is from a colleague of mine in Israel where there was a suicide bomber got on the bus. And this particular patient, as you can see from their x-ray, has fragments in virtually every anatomic location of their body, along with burns, contusions, and fractures. And you know it's a major problem. How do we treat that? Well, just like you do here, and you, know, you have to start with your ABCs, and then you have to really be have a little OCD to hunt down every little thing that could go wrong here. Um, another kind of blast injury, the IED, which is again, combined fragment, blast, burn, multiple anatomic sites. This is from stepping on a ground level IED. And you're gonna see a couple of these because I, I need to show you this is nothing like what we do in civilian practice. And so if you haven't been there, it's a little hard to, to picture it, but I want you to be able to picture how complicated this can be. Uh, and you know, when you're, a young frisky guy um, and then you're confronted by one of these explosive devices and this happens to your fighting vehicle um, there's a different pattern of injury that might come out if you're the guy in the turret from this kind of a blast where you can see the example of the blast the burn the inhalation uh, all the parts of him that are outside of the turret his face and his arms are pretty much devastated uh, saved by his body armor so you know those things do work but you know, now you've got somebody who needs a lifetime of, of really intensive management. It's gonna be a tough, tough go. Um, I'm gonna show you that one of my patients from 2009, I flew in on a Sunday morning, and on Monday morning in Landstuhl, a plane landed, the C-17, and it had seven intensive care young Marines on it. Amongst those seven intensive care Marines, there were still three limbs attached, so you can do the math. Those three limbs all had external fixators on them, and the other 11 legs were gone. Um, some of these patients consume not only time, money, and energy, but they can consume your emotional uh, stores, as I'll show you a little bit why. So this guy was casually number three who came in the door as one of my assignments to help with, had both legs off. He had lost an arm. He had fractures in the existing arm. He had perineal wounds and a colon disruption. Um, pubic ramus fracture, lost an eye from a retrobulbar hemorrhage. Um, the, the guy is really badly hurt. So how did he survive the battlefield? Well, you know, these guys survive because the care at the point of wounding is fabulous. We've got the tourniquets, we've got the quick clot, we've got well-trained people on the scene. We've got this rapid evacuation to definitive care uh, for intubation and, and you know, stopping the bleeding. It's amazing an ethical decision that we have an ethicist in your department. Well, he and I will have this discussion again further. Uh, Dr. Beldowitz is here, so I'll pick on him later. Uh, downrange in the country of wounding, this guy got 64 units of packed cells out of the blood bank and 70 units of fresh frozen plasma, and 21 units of whole blood from his colleagues who line up very willingly to donate uh, whenever there's a call for a specific blood type. He got platelets, factors, then he came to Landstuhl in the next three days. You can see on the other side of the screen, he got another 50 units of PAC cells and 70 of FFP, and he never stopped his coagulopathy. I mean, he kind of knew he was doomed because we couldn't get ahead of it, and it was just really hard. So this is what it looks like on his first trip to the OR. Uh, what you see here is the lower end of the patient. The head's up at the top. You're holding the left leg, which has been debrided uh, all up the thigh. You can see that it's transected through the knee. You can see the exposed femur. Um, you've got the, um, well, let's see here. So exposed femur. You've got the other leg, which is off mid-thigh. Uh, his scrotum, he's also got a bladder injury. He's got a folia, and, and peeking under there is his external fixator from his pelvis. 
So this is his backside where he had his perineal injury, his sigmoid injury. He actually has exposed spinal cord stuff and uh, you know, we're in the OR, which interestingly enough, those of us who operate in the civilian sector, you know, if it's a little bit above 68 degrees in my operating room, I start to fetch a little bit. I don't know about you guys, but you put on all that Gore-Tex and you're a big guy, it gets hot. They put these operating rooms at 92 degrees and you do that to basically try and protect this guy from the hypothermia as best you can. Um, and you do sweat a lot when you do these cases. Uh, five teams of people were working on this guy. He had general surgeons and orthopedists and plastics and urology and the eye docs in the room to try and, and take care of him and to breed all this. And then the anesthesiologist, two anesthesiologists, two techs. This is what it looks like at the end of the case. He's had his open abdomen that you can see in the lower corner here. He's now got the wound vac on. He's got the external fixator on. He's had all these wounds cleaned up. Um, the thing that really caught my eye at the end of the case, and we had to stop because the anesthesiologist just said he's too unstable. Wrap it up, get him out of here, resuscitate him. So when we left the room, probably my all-time record was he had 10 drips going with pressors and fluids and antibiotics and blood products, and he had 10 wound vacs on all these big, huge areas that took all these people to, to kind of take care of. So a massive investment in doing the best we could for this guy very tough problem um, and a lot of people. So what do you learn from the bad? Another quote from Charles Mayo, uh, the only victor in war is medicine, as we're finding out as our you know, treasure and reputation goes down the drain in the middle, uh, sorry, no politics, uh, as it goes down in the drain in the Middle East, what have we gained? Well, we've had some advances in medicine out of this. Uh, if you're an economy kind of guy, you know, business guy, you wouldn't say our ROI on this investment was very good. Uh, but we did learn a lot in medicine. And, uh, so now I want to take you to really what I think is the point of this lecture, because there are things we got out of it, there are things that were good from it. Uh, this is the part that's going to affect your practice. You guys are young, you have a long horizon for practice. There are the other casualties, the guys with PTSD, the guys with traumatic brain injury, the guys who are depressed, who are acting out, using psychotropic drugs, committing suicide. Uh, I don't even have time to get to the economics. We'll see if we can measure it at some point. So through the first of this month, there are 6,940 uniformed troops from our country killed in combat. That's not a big number. You know, a Marine died every two minutes on Iwo Jima for 36 days. So this is not a big number. How many thousands died at Gettysburg and Bull Run? Um, that's a big number if it's your dad or if you're old, my age and it's your child or if it's your spouse, it's a very big number. Uh, as we go on, um, so Iraqi freedom, 4,000, uh, Afghanistan, 2,350. Numbers go up by ones and twos. There was a time here when the meter was running pretty fast during the Battle of Fallujah and some of these other problems. And some of these other places around the world, you know, like Somalia where we're engaged, or now we're in Niger and some other African countries. Uh, total wounded. 52,484 is November 1st. Um, most of them in Iraq, but the numbers in Afghanistan are going up. Again, not, not huge numbers, um, unless it's you or your family member, then it's a pretty big number. Uh, 14 years since mission accomplished was declared. We're coming up on that uh, uh, signal declaration. Um, I think he called that game too soon. Yogi Berra would say it's not over till it's over. The fat lady sings. Um, let's talk about TBI. Just briefly, you all are in this business, so you know about it. Uh, in 2008, the RAND Corporation commissioned a study. It was done by George Rutherford at UCSF with the RAND Corporation. They found that of the 1.5 million troops that had served by that point, uh, they estimated 320,000 had a significant life-altering traumatic brain injury. Uh, now we have over 2.5 million who have served in these theaters, and the VA has claims for numbers between 600 and 750,000 for TBI, no telling how many of those are justified. The reason the number is not accurate is because a lot of this is paper records and no one actually knows how many there are because there's just tons of, of records. Uh, what does TBI do to people? Well, as we know, it re 
you know, takes away some of your executive functions. People have anger, they get headaches. Uh, I think one of the biggest problems is insomnia. Uh, some of these guys get dementia and Parkinson-like sim symptoms, just like the fighters of old, uh, you know, with dementia, pugilistica. Uh, they just can't do executive functions. Post-traumatic stress disorder. I didn't know exactly what this was. It's been referred to in every war by some, you know, it was neurasthenia, it was battle fatigue, it was a lot of different names. We now call it PTSD, I'm sure it'll evolve again. Um, an anxiety disorder that's the result of a traumatic or dangerous event. The estimates based on self-reporting is that 30% of veterans coming back have PTSD post-deployment. And I'm gonna tell you the number probably is 100% because a lot of us don't want to fill out those forms, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that at a point. Um, what do these guys with PTSD get? Well, the number one complaint, believe it or not, is insomnia. I should have put it at the top of the list. Most of the guys tell me they can't sleep, uh, but they get flashbacks, they have anger issues, they act out. So what happens when you have TBI or PTSD, and they cross over because a lot of people will have both, as I'll show you in a case in a minute. They can't complete school, they can't hold a job, they can't keep their family together, they do substance abuse, they medicate with alcohol. Um, when I was in my last trip to Landstuhl, one of my former junior officers was there and the other people had asked me to try and intervene with him because every day he reported for duty in uniform, did his job. At the end of the day, he went to his barracks and he drank until he passed out. And, you know, this is clearly somebody who's having a problem that if we don't intervene, he's going to crash. Um, so risk-taking behaviors, it's everything from smoking, drinking to uh, fighting in uh, the WFA. So domestic violence and those kind of problems are really high. This dovetails a little bit with something we saw earlier here this morning. Let me look at an example. So my least favorite patient in trauma surgery is the drunk driver. I hate drunk drivers because they hurt people and they annoy me because they wake me up in the middle of the night and they're usually nasty. So I don't like drunk drivers. So this guy, I read, I'm reading this news feed and Scott Seipel drove the wrong way down a Tampa interstate, killed the other driver, his blood alcohol was three times normal. Put him in prison, right? He killed somebody. He, he belongs in jail. But you know, I started digging a little because there were some clues in this. He mentioned that he had brain trauma. So you go and look at this guy's biography. He's a Marine captain, had the Bronze Star, three Purple Hearts. Um, and you don't get those in the Marine Corps for little things. It's not a paper cut. Uh, nor is the Bronze Star anything less than incredible heroism. What did, what did he do? Well, he, he had a head trauma. He dug up a grave of murdered Iraqi civilians with this guy, so, you know, that's a PTSD. But here's a citation from 2004. Riddled with shrapnel, completely blown off his feet, temporarily knocked unconscious. There's his TBI. Uh, First Lieutenant Skypel had the courage and presence of mind to remain calm under his mass casualty situation. Disregarding his own injuries, First Lieutenant Skypel led his platoon to repel the enemy ambush, save the lives of multiple wounded Marines. Very nice write-up, very deserved for his heroism. Ten days later, another citation. Disregarding his own life-threatening injuries, he guided heavy machine gun fire into a position that would relieve the pressure of his pinned unit, allow the medevac of his two other casualties. Even after great loss of blood, he continued to lead his platoon until he was ordered to be evacuated. His company commander directed the Marines to forcibly put this guy in the medevac helicopter. I mean, what a heroic guy. I mean, it was all about taking care of his men and not himself. It, it is unique to people in uniform. Uh, to, to a greater extent than I see in other places, although many of our first responders do the same thing day in and day out. Uh, but I can tell you that it is part of being in uniform. So what happens to him? He spends a long time getting his arm reconstructed and everything. Uh, what really struck me as, as one of the vets who obviously had PTSD and mental health issues, um, he really didn't have much counseling. He had phone monitoring. We know how well that works. And over this 10 months, it's too bad, that, I don't know if there are any internists in the room or family doctors, I, I can't write that many prescriptions on a patient in a lifetime, let alone in 10 months. Uh, They're almost all for psychotropics and pain medications. They're for antidepressants, for medicines for insomnia, Provigil will wake them up. Uh, this is a huge problem, we'll talk a bit more about it as we go. Uh, this is a guy who underwent art therapy. First he scoffed at it and then he did it. He came in with all his medicines. So look at this polypharmacy. I mean, clearly, this is a huge problem. And he painted himself like this to say that I am, half of me is a patriotic American who's glad I did what I did. The other half of me feels dead and, and I can't function. 
So, you know, he was actually able with paint therapy to kind of get this out and get help to start decreasing the number of medications because it's so much easier to write a prescription than it actually is to sit and talk with somebody for a while. And that was my experience going to the VA to see kind of how things were happening. In 2010, a Defense Department leaked a report that showed that 20% of their 1.1 million active duty troops were taking prescription medicines, uh, either antidepressants or antipsychotics or sedative hypnotics. Um, we got a couple of guys here in uniform, and I can tell you that when I was in uniform, you couldn't deploy, period, to a combat zone if you took chronic medication. And if you were a pilot and you took an Actifed, you couldn't go up for three days to fly your helicopter. Now, um, you guys who have been there can correct me if I'm wrong, a lot of these guys are taking meds, flying their helicopters, you know. And what's very interesting about this, anytime you listen to an ad on TV for psychotropic medication, you know at the very end where they whisper that part that says, don't take this medicine if you're carrying a gun and you think you might want to kill the guy next to you in the tent. I mean, you know, most kids listen to those ads and go, Dad, why would anybody take that medication? And I'm thinking, why would I give it to some guy up in the mountains of Afghanistan where he's not monitored, he's not supported, and hey, he might run out of it uh, or whatever. I mean, this is a huge change in military culture from my generation to you guys. I, I don't know how it happened. I personally think it is criminal and negligent and bad medicine. Um, a lot of these guys are using medications. Big, big shift in military culture to deploy people on these medicines. Uh, all the side effects from insomnia, hallucinations, and suicidal thoughts probably have impact. Um, you know, there was a, a shootout a couple of years back of uh, a tent where the guys were actually doing psychological support. Somebody came in and killed the psychologist who was an old friend of mine. Um, so I think the use of the psychotropic meds and the writing of all these prescriptions is going to complicate all the treatment we do for TBI, for PTSD, for everything that we do, uh, including the regular health conditions of these guys. And suicide became big. It finally got noticed in the, in the late 2010 kind of time frame. And the reason was up until 2006, DOD didn't keep any statistics on suicide in uniform. Isn't that interesting? Uh, and then some parents started, you know, raising hell of, you know, my kid essentially died because of this war. Why don't we keep these statistics? And now we know that suicide is very common and that more veterans commit suicide every day, approximately 22 in the US commit suicide every day, and that female veterans aged 18 to 34 are three times as likely as their civilian peers to die by suicide. Another interesting fact, clearly their support is even less than the traditional male VA system, although I think there's some awareness of this, it's clearly a problem we have to address. Uh, there's other non-statistics. I'm gonna teach you a little bit about uh, non-statistics. So this is a guy um, who was the psychologist treating stress at an army unit, but he died from suicide after he got a divorce, got depressed, lost his job, and you know, is that a battle casualty? Well, it's not counted as a battle casualty. Uh, we don't really keep track of that. Um, when I was visiting Hawaii, they had a Schofield barracks soldier who uh, basically committed death by cop. He kept ramming the cop cars with his vehicle until they shot him. You know, he left a one-year-old kid to be raised by mom and grandparents. Um, are these battle casualties? Are these going to be on anybody's statistic analysis? Probably not. And uh, then we have Chris Kyle, who some of you may have seen the movie American Sniper. The guy was probably the most famous Navy SEAL marksman ever to deploy, who came home very broken. But he found his way back by taking care of other veterans, which is a theme I'm going to come back to here a couple of times. Uh, ultimately, was killed by one of the people that he was taking care of. So also not a statistic. Survived the actual combat, came home, got killed because of his devotion to the other people who were having problems. So just a... a Second or two about costs. Vets with PTSD, if you look at the literature, they're 200% more likely to be diagnosed with a medical problem uh, within five years of returning from deployment than a control group of similar aged people. And, and those are real medical problems. They're respiratory, they're cardiac, they're GI, they're musculoskeletal. They use mental health, uh, non-mental health care services more than 100% more than their, their age controls. Uh, so sometimes you're going to have to think about looking at your patient and saying, you know, I know you're a trauma patient, or I know you're a drunk who just got assaulted, or you're a, you know, guy, a drug shooter with an abscess, but, you know, did you ever serve in uniform? Were you ever in a war zone? We don't have time for that in the ER at four in the morning. 
Uh, you're going to really have to rely on your caseworkers and your social workers, but you're going to have to peel back the onion. You're going to have to find out why is this person like they are, if you can, which is really the only way to keep them from being back in your ER doing the same thing. So what's this all going to cost? Well, we know by historical projections from guys you know, who do economics that the Gulf War veterans use medical services at a way higher rate than their predecessors, and that the cost of cares are going to go up exponentially over their lifetime, which means the costs are going to reach their peak at 30 to 40 years when your 20-year-old is 60 and starts having medical comorbidities. So there's a lot of reasons. That's one of the reasons. One is that we have survival of guys that never survived these injuries before. Uh, we're seeing very high rates of PTSD and, and TBI and drug use. Um, we're seeing longer lifespans. You know, your patient this morning who was getting this cabbage for his renal transplant, I mean, that didn't occur in my younger generation. So it's just going to get more and more expensive as the, this age cohort is going to age. It's going to get more and more expensive. Um, there's going to be devices and things that people are going to use, as we see here, where uh, some of these can cost several hundred thousand a pop and they wear out every year or two. And uh, it's going to be a very, very expensive proposition. Um, I wouldn't begrudge it to anybody. I think it's great, but you know, it's going to get harder and harder. One other little economic fact that I'm going to toss out there just to think about, uh, one of the shell games of this war, to, to make the statistics false, is for the first time in U.S. warfare we used contractors. We used hundreds of thousands of people from Brown and Root. We used them from Halliburton, which was Dick Cheney's company that had its best 10 years ever, of course. Um, we use uh, uh, some of these other, uh, Blackwater was doing a lot of work with former Special Forces guys. And that way you can pretend that you only have 180,000 U.S. troops in Afghanistan, but you've got 200,000 contractors that nobody knows about. So you can pretend to Congress and the American people that we don't really have 380,000 people fighting and doing business in Afghanistan. So there's a lot of smoke and mirrors and shell games here. Um, these contractors get killed. They get killed, they get injured. Uh, just like in this particular article last year, a couple of guys were training uh, police to do proper police services in countries where the rule of law has been somewhat uh, atrophied. And uh, what the problem is that DOD doesn't keep track of killed and wounded contractors because they don't work for DOD. They work for the Department of Labor, or they report to the Department of Labor, and contractor numbers are self-reported, so we know that no one would ever fudge the numbers. So um, what else is wrong with using a lot of contractors? Well, they don't report to the area commander, so they're not constrained by something we call the Uniform Code of Military Justice. When they commit a crime, they get hustled on the airplane and flown out of harm's <gasps> way so they don't have to face the consequences. Uh, they're not reported, as I mentioned. I don't know where they get treated because they're not in our VA system unless they are vets by you know prior service. Um, and we don't know any data about hundreds of thousands of contractors. There, there have been many, many hundreds of thousands used in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we have no numbers and no idea. Um, so big cost to society coming. Um, the cost will peak in 30 to 40 years. Uh, four to six trillion dollars is going to be a big hit on the national debt for you guys who get to pay more taxes. I'm sure this new tax plan will be great. Um, this is data that's been run by Nobel Prize winner Joseph Stiglitz from Harvard and Linda Blimes. I, I think you need to really be thinking about the fact that this is going to be a very, very big deal from the money point of view. Um, so all these physical injuries have a big toll and the mental health costs have a big toll and the treatment costs, you know, like the prosthetics and the devices. Uh, we can't measure society costs. We can't measure the bad behavior, the homeless guy under the bridge. We can't measure the substance abuse very well. Uh, lost productivity on the job for the guy who doesn't get out of bed in the morning to get to his job. So, but I haven't yet talked about the families. And I think this is really crucially important because uh, five million kids have a parent who's been in one of these war zones since 9-11. That's start thinking about these numbers. I told you there are two and a half million vets who have served in uniform in the combat zone. They have five million kids who are affected by what went on with them. Uh, these are big numbers and uh, it's a tough thing. Um, we know that vets, particularly who are PTSD or PTSD and disabled, have a really hard time with the child-parent relationships. We know that they have a lot of trouble with reconnecting. Um, I used to get it a little bit when I got home. 
from my wife who would say, you know, you might be a big shot in uniform when you're over there, but you know, and here I'm the boss, and you know, you know, I, I, I ran this house without you for six months. So, you know, it is it is a, a tension point, and so it's tough on the kids, it's tough on the spouses, um, you know, and if you look at some of the data now coming out of the kids' psych literature, um, you, this is just one example. I pulled it out because people like data. I know it's a busy slide, but basically 16% of 4.3 million outpatient visits to a, a military healthcare center were for psych problems. So my pediatricians don't tell me that they see, you know, they see rashes and they see colds and they see earaches and they see this and that. They see just a tiny number of these, but it, the numbers are going up. So why? Well, the children of veterans, turns out, start having the same problems that their parents brought home. They have more problems with their schoolwork, they have problems with authority, they get in more fights, they have a lot of risky behavior with drugs and alcohol, uh, they have high rates of depression, suicide. So same problems that we saw of the vets coming home we're seeing in the kids. So you start doing the math, I'm not an economist, but if we have two and a half million veterans with you know, maybe a million and a half spouses and five million kids, you're getting up to a pretty big number. And then you throw in, I'm going to assume a million contractors. Now we're talking about 10 million people who are directly affected by these events that we've had for the last 14 years. Um, then there's also the non-combat people who have come home or come in contact, whether you're a physical therapist down at you know Camp Pendleton or you know, you're the air crew flying that C-17. Um, you, you cannot help but be affected by what you're seeing, what you're doing, and uh, all the stuff that, that we do every day. So I, I think the families of the Gulf War veterans have, are going to be irrevocably damaged by what's been going on. We're going to see more and more homelessness. By the way, TBI guys, within two years, the average vet with TBI, 25% of them are homeless. So there's a statistic for you. That's a, and if we're talking six or 700,000, and we're talking now 200,000, more homeless vets. Um, divorces, domestic violence, child abuse, dysfunctional children. Um, so, so really this is mission accomplished uh, going back to March of 2003. Uh, I, I think it's going to be huge. It's going to affect every facet of your practice, whether you're practicing uh, in a clinic, in an emergency room, um, whatever you're doing, you know, you're going to have more people with more problems that at some point even their medical problems may go back to their uh, other problems when you peel back the onion. Um, one quote for you from Mark Twain, that there are lies, damned lies, and statistics. So, so what I've attempted really to show you is that uh, all the statistics that we get, like the numbers wounded and the number killed, uh, probably fall into that first or second category, although they're called the third category. Um, a lot of VA and DOD numbers exclude those people who aren't going to the VA, so they don't really have good data. And if you're treated at your local clinic or hospital, you're not in their data necessarily. Contractors aren't on anybody's radar. A lot of them actually go back to other countries because they're not, not all from the U.S. Uh, and if you die like, you know, Captain Leonard Ruth who committed suicide or the soldier who drove his car into the police in Schofield Barracks, um, you're not counted as a battle casualty or a result of this conflict. And if you cause harm to others, there's no metric for that. So here in Gilroy a couple years ago, I almost fell off my chair reading this one. Uh, a Iraq veteran comes home, shoots his mother, then killed his 11-year-old sister, and then killed himself. Um, I don't think there's a metric for this. I don't think anybody's tracking it. I don't think it falls in anybody's database. But clearly, this guy came home broken needed a lot better care, and just like uh, Scott Seipel needed something other than a lot of prescriptions to keep from doing what he did. Um, so slip in a little Churchill, the war is ending, but it's not the beginning of the end. Who knows if it's ever going to end. Um, but it's really the end of the beginning. It's the beginning of what I look at doing strategic planning as a global health crisis that's going to hit our jails, it's going to hit um, the ERs, it's going to hit the clinics. It's going to overwhelm social services and safety nets uh, at a time when I think somebody wants to cut the budget for all these things. So you're going to see mental health services go down um, in the next you know, year or two, I think, from what's coming out of Washington. Um, but I think we're going to see a lot more problems with not just the vets, but we're going to see it with their kids. And it's going to be a huge public health crisis. So with all that, don't ever get me wrong. You know, I feel very fortunate to have been in uniform, to have served with people who demonstrate valor 
every day, day in and day out through our history. Some of you may know these pictures. I just have to mention that in this particular picture, the Marines raising the flag on Mount Suribachi, one of those Marines is a Navy corpsman because the Navy provides medical care to the Marines and no Marine ever took a hill without his corpsman right there with him. Um, another statistic for you to think about uh, in the lower corner here, going ashore at Normandy, the average age of the soldiers storming ashore at Normandy was 19. Think about that, 19 years old. So, you know, we've, we've had these problems and issues before. We've been able to deal with them. We were a more responsive society where everybody had skin in the game. You know, now there's no draft. Nobody has skin in the game except for like one half of 1% who are willing to put on the uniform. Uh, those who do serve continue to show the same uh, her heroism and valor that uh, is pretty much traditional in the military. Uh, there are guys that are heroes that I don't have a metric for, but I'm a little bit in awe of them. These are guys who lost their limbs in combat, and after they got their prosthesis said, I'm as good, if not better, than I ever was. I need to rejoin my unit, and they managed to pass the test to get back to their only family they ever really knew because many of these guys come originally from broken homes or from backgrounds of abuse, and the military family is really the only family they ever knew, and that's where they want to be. They may have lost a limb, but they can still you know, function and do whatever it is they need to do. Um, these are guys who are heroic. Um, they're doing a fundraiser, a legless basketball game, because they want to raise money for guys who are less capable than they are, uh, who are injured worse, who are more needy. Uh, I, I think that's pretty amazing, and uh, you know this. Like I say, once you put on that uniform, it, it does change you. Every day, it takes about 1.4 million people to raise the flag in the uniform. So, rather than ask for questions, I think I'm just going to segue into a little bit about what can you do, and how can you guys make a difference. Uh, you're a medical team. Um, and part of it, so I mentioned asking about serving in the war zone, or did you have a family member who served in a war zone, or you know, now that we're dealing with refugees coming from war zones, you know, what about if you're a family from a conflict, conflict area like Yemen or Syria? So, like I said, you're probably not going to sit and do a big interview at four in the morning in the ear, but you need to get the case manager in there, you need to get the social worker involved, you need to um, talk to your professional society maybe about a little more training. Uh, if there's an opportunity to participate in veterans events, every county in California has a veterans stand down every year where for about two weeks they bring all the guys in to catch up on their health care, to get their dental work done, to get eyeglasses made, uh, to get some of their legal things cleared up. And uh, those are good things to participate in. I know we have them in our county at uh, Camp Parks every August. Um, there are organizations, I'm not going to endorse any particular organization to participate with or to uh, give money to, but I'm just going to mention a couple of them, like Hire Heroes and the mission continues. I mean, these are amazing guys who, you know, are reaching out vets to vets, which I think is the key. Um, just a moment to talk about the, this is Lafayette BART station right across the street. Uh, I drive by this pretty much every day. And it started with, you know, one or twosies. Um, it caused a lot of controversy. Uh, points out a little bit about that there are some people who are paying attention to what's going on, but as you know, our news cycle, every two minutes it's something new or a different tweet. And, uh, you know, it, it's hard to keep track that there are people still losing their lives. But, you know, again, you got to have a good literary background. So Archibald McLeish has a poem that's outside the War Memorial Opera House inscribed on granite there. Um, I'm going to paraphrase from it because it's longer than this. But as the young dead soldiers do not speak, nevertheless they are heard. Our deaths are yours, they will mean what you make them. Give them their meaning. We were young, they say, we have died. Remember us. Uh, every once in a while, it's Veterans Day, hopefully more often than once a year. You think about these guys and the, and the survivors who need help. One of my favorites is a quote from John Kennedy where he says, we don't measure a nation by how many veterans it has or how many days we take to honor them. We measure it by how we treat those veterans day in and day out. So when you're in the clinic, you're in a hurry, you're in the ER, and you're frustrated, don't forget to remember that was somebody once who might have been in the uniform. 
Any questions or comments? session like this other than to say I think we all um, owe a great appreciation for what you've brought to us today. We see a lot of these patients here. We um, will promise to take to heart everything you said about how we can do better every day. Thank you.